Welcome to the Global Classroom. I'm Dennis Kimbrough. You know, uh, in lieu of the events that are going down in Florida regarding Black history, a number of folks have asked me for my thoughts and comments. And I've been pretty quiet about it, and I've done that on purpose. Why? Because I go back to a little nursery rhyme, a story that I remember when I was a child. And it's about three animals and they're walking through the forest. There was a tiger, there was a donkey, and there was the king of the forest, king of the jungle, which is the lion. And as the donkey and tiger are walking, they said, boy, this is a glorious day. This is a beautiful jungle. And they were enamored with all the plants and all the flowers. And the donkey says, yes, it is a beautiful jungle. And I especially love this blue grass. The tiger replied, no, the grass isn't blue. The grass is green. And the donkey said, no, 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 let me correct you. The, gra the grass is definitely blue. And at that point, the tiger got incensed and says, come on, man, anybody can see that this grass is green. He said, no, 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 I'm telling you, the donkey said, the grass is blue. Well, at that point, the tiger says, well, let's go to the king of the jungle. Let's go to the lion and settle this for once and for all. So they approached the, uh, the courageous lion and they said, we got a problem right here. I'm trying to tell my dear friend, the donkey, who insists that the grass is blue. I'm trying to convince him that he's wrong and the grass is green. Will you please set him straight, Mr. Lion? So the lion looks at the donkey and says, you know, the donkey is right. The grass is blue. Now, donkey, I suggest that you go ahead and enjoy the rest of your day. Go on your way while I take and, and the tiger aside and he, will, he and I will have a chat. So at that point, the donkey exited and one-on-one, -on -one, the tiger and the lion had a chat. And the tiger says to the lion, why in the world did you tell me and tell the donkey was right? You certainly know that the grass is green. Why would you, why would you say it's blue? And then at the, that point, the lion says, why would you involve me in this conversation? You know that you are dealing with a moron. You know that you are dealing with an idiot. And to make matters worse, besides wasting your time, you now wasted my time with this nonsense. Everybody know that this grass is green, but you didn't have the common sense. Here you are dealing with a fool and you allowed this fool to waste your time and waste the time of others. If anybody needs to be punished, it is you. Well, that's the moral to the story. And that's why I didn't say anything about the black history, what's going on down in Florida. Why would I waste my time with a bunch of morons, with a bunch of idiots and with a bunch of fools who are trying to convince me that there was anything virtuous about slavery? If there was anything profitable, if there was anything advantageous, beneficial, about slavery. Look around, look behind you. Where are you? Well, you're in my study. And for those who have logged on to the global classroom, you know, in this other room right back here, I got rows and rows and walls and walls of books. But here we are, this is where I do my work. You're right here at my computer and behind me are the 30 or 40 books that had a profound impact on my life. Well, what are some of the books that you will find? Well, you'll find Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery. You'll find William Still's book. If you haven't read William Still's book, I, probably, I don't even know if you can get a copy of it. What is it? It is the Underground Railroad. I, would, I, only, I have two copies, two hardbound copies of the Underground Railroad. More than 700 pages of nothing but stories of ex-slaves who escaped the freedom. I have a copy of the life and times of Frederick Douglass. Now, why am I pointing this out to you? Because here you are, these are all stories of ex-slaves who are telling you what life was like in terms of slavery. And these quote unquote, black history scholars down in Florida how scholastic can you be? You're telling me that you're a scholar and you don't even cite Frederick Douglass's book. Well, I'm particularly drawn to that. Why? 
because Frederick Douglass's book, The Life and Times, it's autobiographical, and at one time there were three volumes. Thank God, before he died, they were combined into one set. That book is more than 500 pages long. I'm not telling you to read all 500 pages, but what I am telling you, make sure that you read the following chapters. And I know this verbatim because I've read the book several times. Make sure you read chapter one. Chapter one is called Life as a Slave. And then make sure you read chapter 13. And what is chapter 13? Well, that chapter is called The Vicissitudes of Slavery. And what did Frederick Douglass have to, have to say about slavery? As you may or may not know, his father was a slave master. His mother was a slave. And he was taught to read and write by his father's mistress. Three times Frederick Douglass was sold, was bought and sold into slavery. He had to change plantations. The first time when he was five years old. And he recounts the ordeal. When his, when his slave master father was about to sell a number of slaves, like 20, he, he cites 20 slaves at one time, were, were sold at one auction. And they were all, Frederick Douglass included, they were all lined up. Men, women, children, young, old. They were all lined up with the cattle. They were all lined up with the cows. They were all lined up with the pigs. They were all lined up with the mules and everything was for sale. Number two, he tells the story when he was sold to another plantation and his mother, she lived more than 12 miles away and she worked at another plantation. And he talks about the time how his mother would steal away in the middle of the night to go through the forest, to go through, to risk her life several times. As soon as that sun went down, as soon as the overseer retired for the day, she would steal away in the middle of the night just to hold her baby boy and return back to that plantation a total of 24 miles, 12 miles each way, just to hold her baby boy. Frederick Douglass went on to say that he never met a slave or an ex-slave who ever knew his or her birthday. Never to the time that he died. Never met a slave or ex-slave who could tell you the day they were born. They would always tell you the season. Say, well, man, when, were, when were you born? Oh, I was born in the springtime. And when were you when when were you born? I was born in the winter time. I remember it was cold, or they told me it was cold that day. The first book that Frederick Douglass ever bought was Noah Webster's Dictionary. Noah Webster's Dictionary was the first book that he bought. But the book that had a profound impact on his life was Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death. Something that was only a dream to him. So if you're telling me that you're going to teach black history and you're going to tell me that it was profitable and you're going to tell me that it was advantageous and you're going to tell me, quote unquote, it was beneficial. Take Noah Webster's dictionary and look up the word benefit. And he'll just say this synonymous with what? Advantageous, with a profit. There was nothing profitable about that. And that was Frederick Douglass. So if you don't want to read Frederick Douglass, go to the National Inst Institutions of Health. That's, excuse me, National Institutes of Health. And they will give you all the vital statistics about the average slave. The average slave. Well, the lifespan of the average slave, according to the NIH, is 29 years. 29 years. That was the average mortality rate of a slave. By age 13, you were lucky if you had two teeth in your mouth. By age 13, as a slave. Every day, every moment, every minute that you weren't working, you were fighting off disease. And many of those disease you contracted from your slave master. But here's the good news. Coming from Africa, you had so many remedies, so many remedies to deal with these diseases. 
And what were the diseases? Typhus, smallpox. Oh, how can I forget syphilis? Syphilis and the like. You know, one of the books that I have in my study is uh, Hannah Nicole Jones' 1619 Project. And here we are talking about black history and folks just want to taint it. They want to give a throw a revisionist spin on it, but you can't do that. And why do I say you can't do that? Because in 1945, Dwight Eisenhower, who was the 34, who became the 34th president of the United States, he was a four-star general at the time. And history shows us that Dwight David Eisenhower, he led, um, he led the advance, uh, Normandy advance in World War II at Omaha Beach and the like. Also in his military career, you know, why is this so important? that we get history right. And here, we're, here I am talking about what they're doing down in Florida, throwing a revisionist spin on black history. You can't do that. History is history. And you heard me say it before, what you fail to deal with one day will deal with you. Well, it's dealing with us right now. And it wasn't the 1619 Project, Hannah Nicole Jones, that set the pace. It was the 34th president of the United States, Dwight David Eisenhower. Why do I say that? Because in April 1945, as a four-star general, he liberated three death camps. He liberated three Nazi concentration camps in World War II. He liberated Buchenholz. He liberated Ordruf. He didn't liberate Auschwitz, but he visited Auschwitz. And every time the troops walk through those concentration camps and death camps and death camps, he made sure that every troop, every, you know, infantryman was armed with a camera. And he told them, take pictures, take pictures. And he even pushed on the soldiers, go over there and take pictures over there. See those, see those skeletons? Make sure you take pictures of that. And look at those frail bodies over there. Take pictures. Well, one time, one of the infantrymen went up to him and said, General, in all due respects, why is this so important? Why do you want us to constantly take pictures? And what did Dwight Eisenhower tell that infantryman? He said, because in a hundred years from now, I don't want some son of a bitch walking around trying to convince others that this never existed. That was 1945. That was Dwight Eisenhower, a man who became your 34th president of the United States, telling folks, no, this did exist, and we got to make sure it doesn't exist again. Well, we should salute Hannah Nicole Jones. We should salute her. Frederick Douglass. We should salute William Still, who wrote the Underground Railroad. And we should salute huh, Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington. Because, you know, in written word and in pictures, hey, they pointed out they did the same thing that Dwight David Eisenhower did. So instead of throwing it under the rug, instead of pushing it under the table, instead of banning it, instead of setting it on fire and burning books, we should applaud these authors because if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. So that's my take about the issues of the day. I mean, there's so much nonsense out there that just had my head spinning that they, look, there are only 20 human virtues. There are only 20 human virtues. I've shared them with you before. Number one is achievement. Number 20 is wisdom. And slavery is not one of them. This is Dr. Dennis Kimbrough in the Global Classroom and telling you, hey, your wealth choice arguably will be your best choice. If you like the content and you like the issues and topics that we discussed today, hey, make sure that you subscribe in the future because we've got a lot to say. Make it a great day and God bless.